Today, I'm discussing the vital importance to Evelyn Dunbar of Christian science. Quote, all that is made is the word of God and all is good. To me, it all began with the Murgatroyds, a name that stretches back in Yorkshire to the 14th century. Samuel and Francis and Murgatroyd had at least five children, of whom three are key to our story. Most importantly, from a Christian science point of view, is second child Clara, born in 1863, uh, not 1868 as art websites show. An amateur artist herself, here's a portrait she painted of her niece, Evelyn Dunbar, when Clara was nearly 70. Of more significance is that Clara was a committed Christian scientist who contributed to Christian science journals in both the UK and the USA with a strong interest in the healing powers of faith. Described as a dressmaker in the 1881 census, three years later she married Joseph Stead Cowling, who founded J.S. Cowling, a major textile firm in Bradford. Born in 1871, eight years after Clara was Florence Murgatroyd, aged 19, she is recorded as a schoolteacher. Scots-born William Dunbar was in the garment business, travelled to J.S. Cowling in Bradford from the south of England at a time when Yorkshire was a great centre for wool and textiles. Here he met Florence and married her in 1896. They had six children, five of whom survived, including the baby of the family, Evelyn Mary Dunbar, born in December 1906. Florence was also an amateur artist. That's very important to her youngest daughter. And there we see in much older age there, the artist's mother, Florence Dunbar. I must also make mention briefly of another sibling, Sam Murgatroyd. Uh, at 16, a wool warehouse boy, he married in 1900 and worked his way up in his uncle's firm, becoming a partner, then sole proprietor in 1918. Alec Dunbar states that around 1905 or 1906, Florence Dunbar, who just lost a child, was introduced to Christian science by her sister Clara, upon which she emptied all her medicine bottles down the sink and quote, from that time on, none of us needed medical care again. My youngest sister Evelyn, who was born shortly after that, never knew what it was to have a doctor and in fact never had any of the children's illnesses from which we had all suffered. Florence and her daughters were regular attenders of the Christian Science Church on Sundays, sometimes midweek too, but Father William did not join them. His traditional Scotch, Scottish love of whiskey would certainly not have accorded, I think, with the ideals of Mary Baker Eddy. <laughs> Josiah Stead Cowling and Clara Cowling went to Boston in 1916, risking the dangers of U-boats, etc. Perhaps their positive faith swept away misgivings. Boston was the world centre of Christian science where the first church was based. They were greeted by followers of Mary, ba Mary Baker Eddy at this first church. So what is Christian science? How does it relate to the art of Evelyn Dunbar? Christian scientists believe, and I know we have some a couple of practitioners here today. If anything is wrong, you'll let me know in the questions. <laughs> Christian scientists believe in the Bible and in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. There is a strong belief that the teachings and healing practice of Christ or the application of the laws of God can be practiced today. Christian scientists believe that through prayer, knowing and understanding, all things are possible for good through God, such as the practice of prayer for the purpose of healing of sickness and disease. As Lucy Kent says, it's difficult to connect the doctrine of Christian science to the artworks themselves. It's much more a philosophy that permeates the entire adult life of Evelyn Dunbar, a rejection of the materialistic mortal mind and the grasping of true reality in the form of a divine or spiritual mind. Christian science founder Mary Baker Eddy believed that Jesus could transcend mere physical matter. Mary Baker Eddy had a health crisis in 1866, during which she gained insights from reading the Bible. She published Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures in 1875, and in 1879 founded the first Church of Christ Scientist in Boston. She, 
She believed in God as absolute goodness and perfection, a deity who did not create sin, disease and death. Prayer reveals God's infinite goodness. Getting spiritually closer to God can help emotional and physical health and help for personal adversity. Christian science, the first major religious sect founded by a woman, was particularly popular after 1900, particularly with the upper middle classes, particularly and predominantly among women, all of which fits in with the Dunbars, likewise perhaps a lesser interest of male members of these Christian science families. More of this to come. As a child, Evelyn attended Christian science Sunday school at, at Bowley Hill in Rochester. She and her mother and two sisters attended meetings of the Chatham and Rochester Christian Science Society. Texts from the scriptures and Mary Baker Eddy's book, Science and Health, were the key to the scriptures, were read. In 1918, in announcement in the London Gazette, Josiah Cowling dissolved his partnership with Sam Murgatroyd, leaving the business to continue under Sam, his son-in-law and Evelyn's uncle. In that same year, 1918, Mabel Nicholson wrote to her son, Ben, in Pasadena, California. Will you send me the name of that book you recommend so we can read about this new science you are interested in? So I want to look now at other British artists, contemporaries and their links to Christian science. Two months later, poor Mabel Nicholson, who painted this picture of her son, was dead from the worldwide influenza outbreak. In 1919, <laughs> Father, Sir William Nicholson, remained, sorry, remarried, unfortunately for Ben, to Edie Stuart Wortley, a fellow artist that Ben had, quote, been semi-engaged to. Ben, not surprisingly, took exception to his father marrying his own girlfriend, <laughs> and relations were somewhat strained. <laughs> it was against this background that Ben Nicholson then married Winifred Roberts, another fellow artist in November 1920. Ben was more interested in the philosophical ideas of Christian science providing order, but also freedom of ideas, a framework, if you like. He was not a Christian, but liked the science. The spirit is not materially tangible, but is omnipresent and infinite, whereas matter is mortal and finite. It was Winifred who was the committed Christian scientist. Ben was never formally one, but sensed the reality of spiritual energies. It happened thus. Ben visited Paul and Margaret Nash down at Dimchurch in 1923. The following year, the Nashers visited the Nicholsons up at Bankshead near Hadrian's Wall. It was here that Margaret introduced Winifred to Christian science, likely reinforcing something that she'd been previously discussing with Ben. Winifred later related that she was told by a gynecologist it was not possible for her to have a child. Quote, for many years, we never had a child. This gave us time to work out our profession as painters and to study the drawings, the dawnings of Christian science. One day, a friend who had lost a child, I believe that would be Margaret Nash, introduced Christian science to me. And I said for her, suffer little children to come unto me and forbid them not from Luke's gospel. I thought it for her, not for myself. When I discovered I was to have a child, I was delighted. The gynaecologist said, it's nice to see a miracle. One does not often see one. In April 1927, an exhibition at the Beaux Arts Gallery of Winifred, Ben, Christopher Wood and the Potter State Murray. Winifred stood back to look at the wall that they'd just hung, fell into a trap door left open by a gallery attendant, falling to the concrete floor of the cellar below. My life was saved by a miracle, she said. She woke in the accident ward of a large hospital, but felt she was sitting up in the corner of the room, looking down at the bed where her body lay with screens around it, and Ben reading the 23rd Psalm, The Lord is My Shepherd. Ben told me afterwards that he telephoned a Christian science practitioner. Then, in capital letters, she writes, This was strong help. I was no longer the worst case of a broken back, just someone who'd lose their child. The day after that, just someone whose ribs were broken. On the fifth day, after the staff checked with specialists, I was sent home. They could not understand how I got well. Two months later, the child arrived punctually, a strong and sturdy boy. So, two miracles. Grandson Jovan Nicholson wrote, 
In her numerous articles and letters to family and friends, Winfrey wrote engagingly about her creativity, remarking, flowers create color out of the light of the sun, refra refracted by the rainbow prism. So I paint flowers, but they are not botanical or photographic flowers. The flowers are sparks of light built of and thrown out into the air as rainbows are thrown in an arc. As Lucy Kent says, for Winifred, flowers are the secret of the cosmos, the life they convey. Light is life, truth, love, not something to illuminate matter. Local colour does not belong to any object, as Winifred wrote. A bad painter paints the colour of the surface, a painter whose eyes see light paints the inside that is not exposed to the light of material seeing. In other words, the spiritual essence of something, not its material appearance. So these flowers are for Winifred light, not physical objects. See how she foregrounds and prioritizes them in front of this Cornish landscape. Personal confession, if I wanted someone to paint me a flower, Winifred Nicholson would be my first port of call. <laughs> In the Christian Science Monitor in 1954, Winifred wrote that she wanted to present the still order behind turmoil. She wanted a place where the harmony of space gives its verdict. I like that harmony to be expressed in colour, for colour is one of the surest means for expressing joy, she said. Ben Nicholson parted from Winifred and turned his attention to Barbara Hepworth. In this portrait from very early in their relationship in 1932, Barbara is placed under a crown, linked, posits Lucy Kent, to one of the two symbols of Christian science as seen here. Ben is giving a royal status to Barbara. He thinks of her as queen, his spiritual feelings transcending any material ones. Writing still to his estranged wife now, Winifred, in October 1933, he discussed Herbert Reed's interpretation of Suzanne's emphasis on geometrical structure and its revival in Cubism. Quote, I think it's a very interesting point of view, but of course, without the V necessary Christian science idea to clarify and give it substance. Ben was not a strong Christian scientist, but it remained present in the background to be invoked when health was not so good. As late as 1975, he was still consulting it. Barbara Hepworth herself was influenced by Christian science in the 1930s, presumably after discussions with Ben. The spiritual overriding the corporeal or the bodily, the power of positive thought, an existence superior to the material world, a non-materialist basis for art. Could this be the basis for Hep Hepworth's well-known insertion of holes into her sculptural pieces, the bringing of light into physical objects? Hepworth was pregnant at the time she made this multi-part sculpture in 1934, which abandons, quote, the single integral sculptural mass. In an interview, Leonard Cohen, a man who used many religious sources said, there's a crack in everything that you can put together. Physical objects, mental objects, constructions of any kind, that's where the light gets in. And that's where the resurrection is. This sums up Hepworth's philosophy to me. Here we see a gathering of the Carline artist clan at Hampstead in the 1920s. To the left is a shy looking Stanley Spencer, in the middle, in a white sweater, stands his future wife, Hilda Carline. Hilda's niece, Hermione Carline, told me a couple of months ago that all the Carline family were Christian scientists, with the exception of her father, Richard, who painted this picture. Stanley and Hilda married in 1925. Theirs was not a happy marriage, even before Stanley became obsessed with Patricia Priest at the end of the decade. Kenneth Popel says, Stanley had dabbled with Catholicism, anathema to Hilda, whose family were Christian scientists. She had no trust in ritualized forms of worship. Hilda condemned his earlier Catholic leanings. Stanley tried to persuade himself that Christian science could help him, but the jump was too great. Through Christian science, Hilda saw God in a particular way. God's function was to promote her husband, her family and their well-being. Hilda believed that she was closer to God than Stanley, despite his 
religious urges, Stanley's God was not as intimate as hers. Stanley had heated arguments with Hilda often long into the night. She absented for long periods, presumably back to her family. As Fiona McCarthy says, Hilda, a strong-minded woman and a feminist, was not domesticated to the degree that Stanley had expected. She was a trained artist of much talent. She now found herself frustratingly unable to work. It is claimed that her fervent Christian science principles induced her to refrain from sex for considerable periods, and Stanley resented this. From 1928, Hilda escaped into gardening, not art, Strong parallels, surely, with the king gardeners of all the female Dunbars. Quote, Hilda's crisis of expression was symptomatic of a deeper, of a deeper unease born of a philosophy of life which challenged the significance of everyday human life in general. Hilda's sincerely held Christian science beliefs deemed the existence of the everyday physical world to be illusory. It seemed to Hilda that in her art, She'd been struggling to imitate that illusion and thus was being untruthful. Hilda was bothered that Stanley's own equally strong religious beliefs were not informed by Christian science. Hilda thought that God's presence could only be experienced on the spiritual plane, transcendent to the everyday illusionary world. Stanley's God was daily and necessarily experienced as imminent within a physical reality. In 1940, Stanley writes his thoughts. Marry to satisfy desire and some ideas, but not believing in marriage. Unhappy and ambitions and high ideals being destroyed in me. Utterly unobtainable in her atmosphere, Christian science, etc. Obstructive to all I believe in. There is a sad postscript to this. In February 1929, Richard Carline and his mother were rejoicing at Sydney Carline's successful one-man show. Several days later, Sydney spent freezing hours mending his car at the roadside and later died of pneumonia. And it may be that he was encouraged to refuse treatment by his strong Christian science wife, Gwen Harter, his bride of less than a year. We need to return to Evelyn Dunbar, that's why we're all here. Christian science was integral to her life. Christopher Campbell Howe said it shaped her worldview and her art, a conviction that creation came with duties and obligations, a debt that one owed to the creator. Rosanna Eckersley spoke of Evelyn's Christian science approach to the ordinary and the everyday, but shared with an optimistic and a practical feminism. After a trip to Holland and Germany in 1928, it's likely that the 21 year old Evelyn attended a lecture with her mother and two sisters at Chatham, given by Paul Harsh of the First Church of Christian Science in Boston, Massachusetts. You, I'm sure, remember that this was the founding church of the movement. Later, there was a Christian Science reading room at Rochester during World War II. It was located in Rochester High Street at that shop, the children's shop, run by Evelyn's sisters. Jesse and Midge. Christian science gave Evelyn an outlook on the world. Much of her work can be seen as, quote, a celebration, an affirmation of God's provision, of God's love. She regularly read the scriptures and Mary Baker Eddy's book, A Disciplined Study. In late 1932, Charles Marney took up the challenge to paint murals at Brockley School and Evelyn accepted the challenge, even though there was little prospect of a reward. Marnie was three years her senior. Crystal, Christopher Campbell Howes suggests that the deaths of William Dunbar in 1932 and Josiah Stead Cowling in 1934 led to cash being available to support Evelyn from both her mother and her aunt. This large panel here then is the country girl and the pail of milk. And there we can see Evelyn working on it. She asked her sisters, Jessie and Marjorie to model for her and Ronald, the older of her two brothers too. Here's the story, which I quite like. A country girl was walking with a pail of milk upon her head when she fell into the following train of reflections. The money for which I shall sell this milk will enable me to increase my stock of eggs to 300. 
These eggs will produce at least 250 chickens. The chickens will be fit to carry to market about Christmas, when poultry always bears a good price. So that by May Day, I cannot fail of having enough money to purchase a gown. In this dress, I shall go to the fair, where all men will strive to have me for a partner, but I shall refuse every one of them, and with an air of disdain, uh, toss them all aside. Transport and transported with this triumphant thought, she could not for forbear acting with her head. What had passed on in her imagination, when down came the pail of milk, and with it, all her imaginary happiness. A wonderfully complex perspective. Uh, hopefully you can see a little bit of that towards the back of the painting. And perhaps it's a moral regarding material wealth. As been mentioned earlier, Dunbar had a serious relationship with Charles Marnie. Her Christian science beliefs were not shared by Marnie, who was a left wing atheist. They had much in common, but, quote, only over religion was there a fundamental difference. She said, there are things I'm sure of and truths I can't doubt, having considered and tested them. Whether this was in any way responsible for their breakup, as, said, as has been said earlier, we just can't say. 1937 saw commission by or Noel Carrington on behalf of Country Life magazine to design their 1938 Gardener's Diary. Here we see the months in the calendar with a preparatory April. Some of the figures are alleg allegorical. April, for instance, carries a pot grown apple tree trained into the letters April. The hooded figure of December carries both a Yule log and a wreath with DEC worked into it, as if to mark and honor the death of the old year. And the point I think is everywhere God's bounty, the produce of both human horticultural efforts and God's natural bounty. We see here in the plethora of plants and flowers. Florence and Clara were very keen in, in industrious and knowledgeable gardeners. Evelyn clearly got this love from them. Florence spent much time with Evelyn, her youngest, a shared philosophy of the abundance of creation, depending on the love put into it and the care taken of it. Evelyn liked the book of Ecclesiastes, containing the famous lines, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. Christopher Campbell Howes suggests that Evelyn having to paint nurses and hospital would have been a novelty due to her Christian science, as she wrote in 1942 to the wonderfully named Edward Montgomery O'Rourke Dickey. <laughs> I am being slow in this commission as the subjects were so completely unfamiliar to me, and it's taken me some time to feel at home in them. In other words, official medical facilities were an unknown subject for her, but per perhaps the outsider's eye actually heightened her observations. Certainly her St. Thomas's Hospital in evacuation quarters is a very fine work, a wonderful montage of hospital scenes that conveys most excellently the crowded quarters and industrious activities of the nursing staff under difficult, wartime conditions. There's a strong sense of women's abilities to perform numerous different challenging tasks and to serve, I emphasize that word, in a manner similar to Stanley Spencer's philosophy when nursing in Bristol in World War I, aided by the words of St. Augustine. There is a glorifying God in all his different performances, ever busy, yes, yet ever at rest, gathering, yet never needing, Bearing, filling, guarding, guarding, creating, nourishing, perfecting, seeking, thou though hast no lack. This is so similar to Evelyn and the idea that you have an obligation to serve in return for the bounty that God has given you. A fee of 35 guineas was agreed for her work, and as has been said, the War Artist Advisory Committee was so impressed that they gave her 70. This success led to Kenneth Clark hiring her as a salaried employee, um, as has also been emphasised, the only salaried woman war artist. Evelyn married Roger Foley in an Anglican church in Strood near Rochester in 1942, no doubt a compromise with Roger's Methodism and Evelyn's Christian science. All the living Dunbars, including Florence, bar Alec in the Navy, 
though there's no mention of 79-year-old Aunt Clara living at Hearst Green in East Sussex, some 30 miles distant. Evelyn's mother, Florence Dunbar, died two years later, also at Strood in June 1944, doubtless succoured in her illness by her Christian science beliefs and the care of Evelyn, who was consequently slow in completing her war artist's advisory committee work. Roger was from a strict Methodist background from Colm in Lancashire. He appeared to have no difficulty with Evelyn's Christian science. They met mid-1940, around the time of the fall of France. He knew her as a positive and loving person and that theirs was a meeting of minds. Roger appreciated her gardening and painting and principled outlook on life, albeit based on Christian science. An adapted quote, both were hard workers, neither were lazy in th thought, word or deed, a shared dedication, commitment, purpose. This picture is a celebration of thinking, said Roger of it, hence the cerebrant. What was it? The cerebrant. Must get that right. <laughs> it's a very cerebral picture, that much I can definitely say. There he is. There's the husband looking most thoughtful. I do like that. She's really captured him, I, I would suggest. Evelyn made three paintings over a period based on the story of Joseph. Joseph's dream was sent to an exhibition for schools, a moral message, Joseph, a model of Christian virtue. Joseph believed in divine providence. God is good and always present. And again, on the left, you see there the bounty of nature, part of the divine cosmos. In 1950, Evelyn moved to the Elms, a remote house near Wye in Kent. Often apart from Roger, she was a regular at the Christian Science Reading Room at nearby Ashford. Mainly, apparently, women of a similar age to Evelyn, who was then in her mid-40s. In other words, of that generational wave of Christian Science uh, women born either side of the turn of the century. Evelyn, as we've heard, was to do a large mural at Bletchley Park Teacher Training College, the last of these colleges to be opened under an emergency scheme to recruit post-war teachers. However, there were logistical problems. Bletchley to Wye was 120 miles distant, on almost diagonally the opposite side of London as well. In the end, a decision was reached for just two panels for the college library, Alpha and Omega, the college motto. Alpha Evelyn had regular children visit from the Caldicott community a mile or two from the Elms. One was Barry Patterson, aged 10 or 11, who modelled for Alpha. Holding a trusty staff, he is at the beginning of his journey. The horn he holds belonged to the, prince, the vice principal, Josephine Hodgson, and here forms a small Alpha, the first letter of the Greek alphabet. The alpha shape is certainly small and subtle, but gives the great idea of a clarion call to announce the beginning. There are children playing in the background. Is the water related to the spring of the water of life? Omega, a much larger symbol, a hoop covered in fruit tree foliage. Marcella Allender, close friend of Evelyn, may well have modeled for the serious minded student on the left of Omega. Both pictures have a strong red and blue theme that unites them, not least the mineral swimming trunks and Marcia's blue dress and red reading matter. Omega is about civilization, family, i.e. the baby, and the bounty of nature. Revelations. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. And here we can see, I think I've put the symbols there for you. And the arms that were granted in 1966, apparently, to Bletchley Park Training College in my end is my beginning. It was after these pictures that Evelyn, it is said, would have begun to experience symptoms relating to the hardening of the arteries, perhaps pain and fatigue. But it seems she bore these stoically in line with her belief in the rejection of medical aid that she'd grown up with. One factor that has led to a lack of exposure to, of Evelyn Dunbar 
was her complete dislike of advertising or self-promotion to an unusual degree. I posit the idea that she was seeking spiritual rather than material rewards, that she would obtain her share of the Earth's bounty from God rather than man. Andrew Lamberth says, she was part of a generation who did not seek publicity for their work, rarely exhibited an apparently modest self-valuation all too readily accept accepted by subsequent generations. We could compare Evelyn's work with that of the far more famous Dame Laura Knight. Dunbar's palette is quite matte compared with Laura's gloss. Knight's work is theatrically illuminated. The women, plus one man in the background, are there as staffage, as filling. This is all about one woman and her individual efforts. Dunbar shows ordinary women working as a team, strong diagonals that lead to a vanishing point at the back of the picture. Laura Knight has, mon has monumentalized Ruby Loftus, if this photo is to be believed. She has made Ruby bigger with her head higher and nose closer to the wheel. She's been glamorized, spotlighted, her right arm now upright like a piston. Knight's picture has instant impact like a film poster. It, it meets the demands of the modern short attention span. I'm reminded of a quote from Georgia O'Keeffe discussing her flower pictures. I'll paint what I see, but I'll paint it big, and they will be surprised into taking time to look at it. Even busy New Yorkers will take time to see what I see. Can I perhaps suggest that the Dunbar picture keeps rewarding study? The intricate patterns of the camouflage nets, the faces and bodily positions of the team of women workers, those cropped pictures in the background, the nurse coming through the door. It is detailed, balanced and unified. Christopher Campbell Howes posits that Dunbar had a number of special qualities compared to the male war artists and their, and their pictures, which were often related to action and combat. Flashes of kindly wit, the promotion of the cause of women, the synergy between man and creation. This made me think that any of these would have made her a very special war artist. The combination makes her unique. So let us consider these to finish. Firstly, flashes of kindly wit. Is there another wartime picture that matches the wonderful incongruity of milking practice with artificial udders, at the same time demonstrating how women could learn new skills with concentration and determination? I think it was a really good point made earlier on about how these may well have been urban girls uh, you know, who were having to learn the, these skills. The promotion of the cause of women. Women working together, showing both brain and brawn. Coordination, dealing with the mechanical. No solitary worker, as in Laura Knight's Ruby Loftus, but teamwork among women with not a man to be seen. And I think this is one of her uh, finer, finer pictures without a doubt. Lovely complimentary reds and greens and great perspectives and a lovely long diagonal caused by the uh, caused by the machinery. In 2013, Roe Dunbar, who was married to Evelyn's nephew, was watching the television program Antiques Roadshow when Autumn of the Poet was submitted for comment. It was highly praised by the painting expert Rupert Maas and was estimated to be worth between 40 and 60 thousand pounds, though difficult to appraise as by what is perhaps an unknown artist. This prompted Roe Dunbar to look into a tightly bound collection of artworks Roger Foley had left after Evelyn's death, which she thought would have been by Evelyn's mother, an amateur painter. They turned out to include more than 500 paintings and drawings by Evelyn. So thirdly and finally, the synergy between man and creation. Autumn and the poet, a verdant Cotswold countryside at harvest time, Richard Campbell Howes describes an intensely personal intermingling of art and love. It shines with sheer joy in life. 
Like Winifred Nicholson, there's a strong belief in the harmony of life and that to paint was to experience joy. The autumn glow is a spiritual presence. The poet wakes from a dream to see the mythical figure of autumn standing there. Autumn is offering Roger, for it is he, physical and spiritual protection. One thinks of contemporary to Evelyn neo-romantic art where either trees or, and foliage are a place of safety in wartime or where flora is so abundant as to be almost threatening or I would suggest in this case both. But in Dunbar's picture nature is warm, nature is nurturing, nature is giving. We observe a long white sheet containing the bounty of the fruits of the earth. The sheet is a burial shroud but also a cocoon from which new life will emerge. In Christian science there is no death but the discarding of the physical body and entry into the world of light. Life comes full circle. Evelyn died within a year of completing the painting. Inscribed in the Book of Remembrance was unto the perfect day. Thus I end as I began. My alpha is my omega, in my end is my beginning. All that is made is the work of God and all is good. Thank you. <laughs>